Athletic Football Show. Welcome to the Athletic Football Show. Today is Tuesday, March 15th. I'm Robert Mays. Joining me today is my good friend, Lindsay Jones. Lindsay, how you doing? I'm great. I'm, I'm ready to do this. It's been another fun day of free agency. So, And hopefully something crazy will happen in the next hour. Let's go. I'm sure something will. I'm sure at least one crazy thing will happen. So we're going to talk about some of the signings that have rolled in since I recorded with Nate yesterday afternoon. We're going to talk about some team-wide plans that we've liked, that we've disliked, that have made sense, that haven't made sense. Before we get into some of that stuff, though, let's start with, in my opinion, the most fun news of today so far. We had some drama. We had some switcheroo free agency drama with a pretty big name. So uh, earlier today, this morning, news comes down that Randy Gregory is signing a five-year, $70 million extension with the Cowboys. Makes sense. You know, they move some money around with Marcus Lawrence yesterday. They bring back both of their edge rushers. It's like, okay, here's this core of this Cowboys team that we know can compete. We saw what their defense was last year. Good for Dallas keeping it all together. And then, I don't know, hour later, 90 minutes later, maybe a little bit later than that, we get news that that deal has fallen apart. And now Randy Gregory is headed to Denver for the exact same terms. Yeah, and so Randy Gregory was on the kind of the short list of edge rushers that the Broncos were interested in, the guys that were, you know, they could potentially be pursuing. It was Randy Gregory, uh, Chandler Jones, and then Vaughn Miller has kind of been the, um, you know, the, the fantasy player that every that Broncos fans wanted. But so I remember when I saw that, I was like, okay, well, that's a guy off the list for the Broncos, right? Randy Gregory. Huge, Scott. because it's a short list. And you, even yeah. after yesterday with Hassan Reddick going, Emmanuel Ogba re-signing, I mean, that group of edge rushers that you would really want that's kind of in that de- one step down from premium tier was tra- starting to dry up pretty fast. Yeah, so, you know, that was my immediate reaction. Like, it made a ton of sense for Dallas. You know, Randy Gregory, obviously, the, the Cowboys have put a ton into him in, turn of, in terms of investing into his future. They've stuck by him through multiple suspensions, you know, really kind of helped him turn his life around um, and get his career back on track. And he had a, the best year of his career last year. I mean, he, from a production standpoint, just in terms of the amount of pressures he was able to generate, um, his turnover rate, you know, I think he forced eight fumbles last year. So it just made a ton of sense that you would keep that group together kind of as the core of your defense. Um, also, obviously, the Broncos had other plans. Randy Gregory and his agent, Peter Schaefer, ultimately had some other plans. And I'm dying to find out kind of the full story of exactly what went down during that you know hour or so where Randy Gregory flipped his commitment from the Cowboys to the Broncos. It sounds like, based on what has been reported, I think Charles Robinson from Yahoo said something about this, and a couple other people have said something similar, is that they tried to change some language or add some language at the last minute after they'd already agreed on the terms. Randy Gregory and his people were not into that, understandably so. And when you have another offer waiting on deck it's pretty easy to say you know what if you're going to do that we're just going to take our wares somewhere else here yeah now there's some damage control like literally live as we're recording right now kind of coming out of dallas that they're saying okay no it was it was standard contract language it was the type of language that is in every cowboys contract i guess except for Dak prescott's where the team can recoup money if a player is um fined or suspended by the nfl um so you know i think that there's some damage control on that end I can't also imagine that the Broncos wouldn't have some sort of stipulations in their contracts, you know, for for off field behavior. That's pretty standard stuff, Um, you know, but ultimately, like, look, this is the, you know, quote unquote, legal legal tampering period deals that happen on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday morning. um, They're non binding. I mean, you can give your word. You know, it's happened before. Not a ton of times. Um, Frank Gore was really the first one a couple of years ago when he agreed to go. uh, He agreed to terms with the Eagles. And then ultimately end up going to the Colts. I believe that was during his free agency there. Um, and then there was somebody two years ago, right? Um, the Vikings, uh, Kendricks, right? So I can't remember. No, Anth- was it Anthony Barr? Maybe it was, it was Anthony, Anthony Barr. Barr. I think, I think it, was it was Anthony Barr. Barr. Was somewhere else. Yeah, so yeah, this yeah. has it's happened a couple before, times. right? Where, and, you know, now we're at the stage where, you know, teams, especially with the guy re-signing, like uh, Randy Gregory was going to be, where teams can put out information. They can... Um, announce it as the Cowboys did. So that was kind of embarrassing that they had to like take down a tweet. Um, But there's just so much information out there right now about contract terms and agents get really excited. They want these big contract numbers out there right away. So there's a lot of information out there that 
other teams could probably use against them and say, nope, let's renegotiate, come back, we can match that offer. Are you sure you really want to do that? Look at the other guys that we're bringing in right now. Um, don't you want to be part of you know this that's going on? So there's there's a lot of that stuff going on, and I'm actually kind of surprised that it doesn't happen more often that, that guys switch their commitments during these 48 hours. So like you mentioned, if you look at the numbers last year on a per snap basis, if you look at like the pass, rush, pass rushing productivity, say that 10 times, from PFF, Randy Gregory on a per snap basis finished right between Von Miller and Robert Quinn, which is kind of an interesting two guys to land between. Von Miller, somebody he's theoretically replacing in Denver. Robert Quinn, someone who, like Randy Gregory, had a really big spike year to kind of rebuild his value in Dallas. He was 11th in the league. I mean, he was one of the more disruptive players on a per play basis last year at that position. So if you're the Broncos and you're looking at the players available and you don't necessarily want to be in that Chandler Jones, Von Miller, $20 million a year potentially tier, but you still want a difference maker, that tier of guys was starting to disappear very quickly. So to land him at a clear position of need, like when we were listing off what the Broncos still needed after making the Russell Wilson trade, edge rushing help was one of the first things we mentioned. This is a huge win for them. And they're getting it at, in my opinion, a pretty decent price because there's a lot baked into it. He's 30 years old, obviously the history. But if you look at the player he was on the field last year, and if you could project that forward, $14 million for that guy when you're at the stage the Broncos are at, I think is more than justifiable. Yeah, absolutely. And you can, if you're the Broncos, you can talk yourselves into how good this pass rush could be. When you have Bradley Chubb on one side, Randy Gregor on the other, they got some nice like depth pieces, Malik Reed, Jonathan Cooper, some young guys, but they need like two, you know, solid edge rush, edge rushers. The question for both Randy Gregory and certainly for Bradley Chubb is, can these guys stay healthy? How many snaps will they actually play together? Because, you know, look, I live here in Denver. We've spent a lot of time talking about you know, over the years, how exciting it was to have Bradley Chubb and Von Miller together, what that what that duo would look like. And they just never played together because either Bradley Chubb was hurt or Von Miller was hurt and then Von Miller was gone. And, you know, Randy Gregory has um, has had some injury issues. He had trouble staying on the field at times last year because of his health. Uh, Bradley Chubb, obviously a lot of injury issues. So this is going to be a really huge year to see if this will work. Um, but I think it's a gamble worth taking. Um, I, I, I kind of respect what George Payton is doing here. His free yeah. agency plan has been very strategic um, and it's been very front seven heavy. So you look after at it, going after Russell Wilson on top of adding Randy Gregory, they signed DJ Jones yesterday to what is the going rate for defensive linemen right now? It's a three year, $30 million contract. That's what BJ Hill went for. A lot of guys signing in that range, more or less the deal that Shelby Harris would have been on this year. If you look at the money. So after the trade Shelby Harris, they kind of swap that out. DJ Jones is, a really fun player. I mean, somebody that we have loved watching in San Francisco, really disruptive against the run, I think has more pass rushing juice than it might seem at first glance. This is another one of another entry into the Chris Kasurik school of finance. If you want to get paid, just go play for the Niners for a little while as a defensive lineman. But I completely understand how you land on this guy again, as somebody you want to add to that front, you're trying to be more disruptive. You have him. Now you have Randy Gregory, you have Bradley Chubb. I mean, this is a group that is suddenly coming together and that's before they re-signed Josie Jewell, who's another person we mentioned on the podcast that never aired when we were talking about the Broncos and the guys that they had and the holes they might have. So you're looking at this team right now. I mean, there just aren't that many holes left on the roster. And we've said that about them in the past. The difference is now their quarterback is Russell Wilson. Yeah, so I would say the remaining vacancies, the thing that they really need to do now, right tackle is, has to be their top priority right mm -hmm. now. And they don't have a ton of wiggle room left with their salary cap. I mean, they have, they have a little bit of room flexibility here and there. So I don't know if they're going to be priced out of kind of what the next tier of the right tackle free agent market looks like, or if that's somewhere that they're going to have to address in the draft. They obviously do not have a first round pick um, anymore, but maybe that's somewhere that they can address. They, they brought back Calvin Anderson on a one year deal, but it was less than what they would have been if they tendered him which to me doesn't inspire you know, a ton of confidence that they are, you know, that this is the guy they really wanted to be their long-term right tackle. Um, so that's the spot. And then there's a couple of, look, they need depth corner. They need a tight end. Um, maybe a little bit more you running You don't believe back. in Albert O? I mean, I, I like Albert O. He hasn't proven that he can stay healthy consistently. And he's one guy. They they need, to, you know, they need more, some more depth there. They brought back Andrew Beck, who's more of kind of a blocker slash fullback guy. But I'd like to see them probably add another another tight end, but that's not somewhere they have to go spend a lot of money. I, I think right tackle is the one position right now that's kind of a glaring need for them. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious to see where they end up going. 
want to see how that right tackle market ends up shaking out that veteran right tackle market with the Morgan Moses of the world, Riley reef. Cause there are a bunch of teams, I think still in that conversation that would like a player at that position, the chargers. If after they release Brian, Brian Bullock, I think that's a formality at this point. Um, obviously I think the Bengals are probably still in that conversation. I mean, there are teams that could be looking at that spot and how, where that lands. I mean, if you can get one of those guys for one year, 6 million, you know, whatever that ends up looking like, maybe you give it a two year deal to kind of push some money into the following year. I, th those guys have not started coming off the board yet. So what that ends up looking like, I think is going to be really interesting for some of these teams who really just need an answer there in the short term. Because if you sign a guy for one year, five million, then at least you don't have to draft someone. You don't have to say we have to come away from the first two rounds of which the Broncos don't really have any picks with a guy at that spot. So having that flexibility is really nice on the Cowboys side of this. It's been a couple moves at pass rusher, obviously, over the last couple of days. They wanted to bring back Randy Gregory. Gregory, They did bring back DeMarcus Lawrence. Three years, $40 million, $30 million guaranteed. This is one of those moves where it just felt like, all right, we can either cut you or you can redo your deal, stay here in a place you want to be and make it easier for everybody. And that seems to be where the two sides landed. Yeah, and it made a lot of sense, right? I mean, it, it, he's been at his best there. They needed to keep him. This is not a backbreaking type of deal, they get a little bit more room. So that made a lot of sense. I'm guessing they did that with the idea that Randy Gregory would also be part <laughs> of that equation. So now where do they go? I mean, they have a very clear need at edge rusher opposite of Demarcus Lawrence right now. Yeah, if you look, I mean, Demarcus Lawrence is a really good player. I mean, even for if you look at the cap hits and what he's going to make, I mean, they had to spread some stuff out and everything else. But I mean, this is a win for them. He's a really good player when he's on the field. Now the question is, what do they do at that other spot? And it sounds like Von Miller might be potentially in the plans. I, I it, Now that that spot is open, could this be a blessing in disguise where they miss out on Randy Gregory and then somehow find a way to sign Von Miller? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be necessarily like fit in line with the type of signings that they make. You know, they don't typically go out and spend a lot of money on these type of players. But Demarcus Ware is out recruiting right now. He's recruiting his friend Von Miller um, on Instagram. He said he's already called him. They talked about it. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I think Von would. Von is very much enjoying his free agency. I mean, I think if you follow him on any of his social media, that has been the takeaway from the last several weeks. I think he's very much enjoying. This is the first time he's ever been a free agent, right? Because he was franchise tagged by the Broncos and then signed a long term deal with the Broncos and then he was traded. So he's never actually been out there on the free agent market before. And he's coming off of a ridiculous postseason run and showing that even at age 32, almost 33, I think his birthday is here in a couple of weeks, um, that he's a valuable player and he deserves kind of to be courted. Um, I, I think fully he enjoyed... support people at age 33 deciding that, you know, they're really hitting their stride. That That's what right? I'm after here as someone in that and... age range. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and I, I think he very much enjoyed the love that was coming his way from Denver and from Broncos fans wanting him to come back. He was uh, stoking that fire. Um, you know, he's been playing it up, I think, with the Rams. And look, he is from Dallas. He is a Dallas guy, DeSoto, Texas, went, went to Texas A&M, a ton of really deep roots there. He owns property. He owns a ranch. Look, if, um, if the Cowboys came calling with an attractive offer, I think Von Miller would be very, very receptive to that. All right, you got your news for when we were on the show. The Patriots have traded a fifth round pick for Shaq Mason, which, I mean, totally understandable, right? If you're on the Patriots timeline, we need to fill that spot right now. Ali Marpet retires. We'll see what happens with which position those guys play. I mean, Shaq Mason was a right guard, right guard. for the Patriots. Is he going to play that for the Bucs as they kind of figure out the interior of their offensive line? They brought back Aaron Stinney. So, I mean, hopefully they're going to have – a full slate of guys now on the interior and I, I, the other move that they the bucks made today that i loved they went out and got russell gage yeah. russell gage is a really good player i mean russell gage is somebody that i thought could be the perfect two for a team that was desperate for a wide receiver the bears are a team that i mentioned with him coming into it i, I thought that a team that had a bare wide receiver room could really use him just as a stabilizing force instead he signs with the bucks and is their number three receiver I mean, yeah he goes to a team that does not have a bare wide receiver room uh, listen, <laughs> he's got a very full wide receiver room i think that the russell gage move the shaq mason move just more proof this team is going for it i mean they are trying to they're pushing it all in right now and you cannot blame them whatsoever T tom brady didn't come back for them to just be like eh, maybe we can make Certainly the divisional not. round again 
right? Um, but speaking of bear wide receiver rooms, what the hell are the Falcons doing? All right, so we're going to talk about the Falcons here in a second because <laughs> okay. I want to dig through. Who are, look at their receiver depth chart right now. It is, oof. I want to. We'll talk about the Falcons in a moment because I want to kind of comb through some of the quarterback news from the last twenty four hours. The numbers on the Aaron Rodgers contract are out. They're insane. When you look at the actual details of it on over the cap or spot tracker or whatever, he has a hundred and seventy five million dollar dead cap hit this year. If they were to move on from him, obviously they wouldn't. But when you look at the dead cap hits for the next two years, it's over a hundred million dollars. It's hilarious. The cap was 182 last year <laughs> and he would have a dead cap hit of 175 million in this moment but it totally makes sense right so they have this odd structure where they bring his cap hit for 2022 down to about 28 million dollars it was 46 million so you save 18 million with one little stroke of the pen he has a 58 million dollar option bonus next year and a 47 million dollar option bonus in 2024 which is a structure that you don't see used very often with that as soon as you pull that lever, you can prorate those bonuses over the rest of the life of the contract and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And that's what they're doing. When you hand this money out, it's got to go somewhere. And eventually it all comes due. The hope is that one with teams, you can either outrun it and the cap is going to grow enough where it ultimately isn't going to matter. Or two, you just don't care. You know, you're driving this thing off a cliff at some point and you're willing to live with that. And with the Packers, it seems like a little column A, a little yeah. column I think it's I think it's both. I think I think they very clearly think this will be worth it because they should be able to win a Super Bowl or they're a Super Bowl contending team with Aaron Rodgers on the roster. Um, so I think they could do, I think they, they it's, it's what the Saints did, right? I think the Saints just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. They always had a contending roster. It didn't end up working. They never actually got back to the Super Bowl, didn't win another Super Bowl with Drew Brees, but they went in and pushed and pushed and pushed it every year and now they're trying to figure it out this is Look kind of it. what happens it's cap it of 28 million this year 31 million next year and 40 million two years from now then it goes to 60 million or something crazy so those three years are the deal are the years where they have planned on all right if he's here this is what these are what the cap hits will be we can spend in this way if he plays for longer than that then they have to do something they tear it up and start over and kind of climb further into this hole but this is a world and a lifestyle that they have fully committed to and I totally understand it. This is probably your best chance. Committing to him in this way was your best chance. And now you have to do what's necessary to make the most of that. Yeah. And those are his ages, 38, 39, and 40 year old seasons. So it's not insane to think about extending beyond that. But um, we very clearly know what's going to happen over these next couple of years. And now the big question is Devontae Adams and what his contract is going to look like, what room is left. Um, there's been My a thing lot. is, what's another thirty million? Just, just throw right. another fire just do on it, the wall right? at just this push, point. Just push it further out. Um, you know, I think the one like Devonte Adams nugget today is from James Jones, NFL Network, who is very tight with those guys, very, very plugged in um, directly to those players in the Green Bay locker room, saying that um, Adams is adamant that he will not play on the tag. So, I think it's going to get ugly and probably real uh, messy before it gets better between Devontae Adams and the Packers, but there's no way that Aaron Rodgers was coming back after all of this for Devontae Adams to not be part of the 2022 team. It's just going to be a, a lot of mess trying to get there. If you're looking at, if you're Devontae Adams and you're looking at what just happened over the last 24 <laughs> hours and Christian Kirk getting eight, 17 million a year or 18 million a year, whatever it is, uh, even TJ Chark getting 12 million a year, Amari Cooper planning on a three million or three or $60 million deal. Mike Williams making 20 million a year. I wouldn't be happy either if I was playing yeah. on a $20 million franchise tag, if I were kind of undisputably the best receiver in the league right now. All right. A little, some more quarterback news here. sounds like the Browns have entered into the Deshaun Watson conversation. It's been reported that they were flying to Houston uh, earlier, I think it was on Tuesday, to meet with Watson and his people. This does not surprise me. When, when they made the Cooper trade, and I was kind of looking at it, it feels like they could want to get in on this because they have a ready-made place for him. They have an argument. Now that they have Cooper in place, you have a number one receiver. You Potentially, if you could draft another receiver 13th overall, if you express that you're looking to do that, you have a really good offensive line, even with the J.C. Treader move, which we'll discuss. And you have an offensive-minded head coach, a defense that's ascending. I mean, this team absolutely is in a really good spot roster-wise to make a case 
to Deshaun Watson. If they trade Baker Mayfield back to Houston as part of this deal, they save a really big chunk of money. They can do it under the cap. I mean, all of the signs pointing to this on a football level made sense to me. Yeah, and it's really interesting because when you look at the team, the other teams that are involved in all of this, it's just basically everybody in the NFC South. Um, the, the Texans declined to allow the Texans or um, the, the Colts, excuse me, to meet with. Um, you, don't, you don't say. They're not going to trade him within the division. They still hold some cards there, which is interesting because he probably would. I mean, from a football perspective, that's probably somewhere that he would want to go. Good on um, the Colts, the, by the way, for making the call. Just so make you the call, do your right? Due diligence, right? Um, just find out, right? And instead, now it's um, basically the Browns as the only team in the AFC. It is really interesting because even if they don't get him, right? Even if ultimately Deshaun Watson ends up in New Orleans or Carolina, this is like the point of no return with Baker Mayfield because, I mean, he would still be your quarterback if you don't pull off this trade, but it's pretty clear about their plans for him and how they view him and their prospects of winning with him long term. Um, so it'll be a real awkward season, I think, for the Browns. It always felt like they were going to move on when the opportunity presented itself. This is the opportunity. Yeah. Baker Mayfield at $18 million is more than palatable. And I feel like that's the way that they've been looking at this. I don't know. They don't want to commit to him long term. But if you're looking at the quarterback landscape, Carson Wentz is making 28 this year from Washington. Baker Mayfield at 18 is something you can talk yourself into. But if there is a pathway to a better quarterback, they're going to try to take it. And that's exactly what this is. They haven't given up any draft capital in any other places. I mean, they're ready to make a move like this. So I, it's not surprising to me at all. The Falcons were a bit surprising. The idea that the Falcons have entered the chat here as it relates to Deshaun Watson, Diana Rossini reporting that, that Watson actually pushed for a meeting with Atlanta. He's from the area. I mean, I don't understand why else. The Falcons would be a attractive destination for Deshaun Watson at this point, but it does seem like they have kind of come into the conversation a little bit. Yeah, because there's no but nothing else about that roster that you know you would look at and say, "Oh, that's a place that I want to go." We were just discussing this. What does the Falcons' yeah. wide receiver depth chart look like? Yeah, and I don't know if this is just about you know having a prior relationship with the with Arthur Blank. That's somewhere that he feels comfortable, that he would be supported. Maybe he wouldn't face the type of scrutiny that he might get other places you know he obviously has a support system i mean literally his hometown of gainesville georgia is 10 miles i google mapped it a little while ago from the flowery branch facility which is about an hour from downtown atlanta but this is a place where he um probably feels really safe and protected and um but i don't know if it's a place that he would win there's been a lot of league speculation today that this is just kind of like gamesmanship by the falcons and trying to drive up the market um, and drive up the price that their division rivals would have to pay as the panthers and the saints are the other two um, teams that are interested right now and that i've already met with him um but yeah it's it is it's the one that's the most like financially complicated because if the falcons interest is it's complicated on significant so many levels yeah, I mean, they have a very expensive veteran quarterback that I'm sure they'd love to figure out a way to get out from under the Matt Ryan contract, but getting into another expensive quarterback contract isn't necessarily the way to do that. Did they just restructure Matt Ryan's contract? So, so now there's even more dead money on the cap if they move yes. on from him in this moment? So according to Spotrack, um, or excuse me, Jason Fitzgerald at Over the Cap, um, there's the restructuring has been like agreed to, but not actually filed with the league yet. Interesting. So it's a little unclear exactly what his numbers are, if it's officially restructured or not. Um, there have been some reporting on it, and Mike Rothstein from ESPN.com has reported on the restructure, but it apparently has not gone through the the official NFL contract system to be, be officially on their books yet. So uh, it's a little confusing. Um, you know, there's some like post June 1st designations to move on and save some of the money, but it doesn't make a ton of sense other than. Deshaun Watson wanting to be at home. And we're back to all of the icky, the, the stuff that makes me feel real icky talking about this, about, you know, a guy who literally last week was, you know, facing grand jury testimony um, and is still facing uh, an open NFL investigation and 20 active civil lawsuits getting to just kind of like dictate exactly where he wants to go to continue playing football. But here we are. If you're Atlanta, even if the finances of it are a little bit complicated, I do think it makes sense when you're talking about their plan overall, because it doesn't seem like they really had one and to no, no fault of their own, really. 
you know, the, the financial mess that they were left with didn't leave them a clear out and didn't really leave them a clear pathway to the next stage of this if they didn't like any of the quarterbacks at four. So Deshaun Watson, if they do make this move and it's Deshaun Watson and Kyle Pitts and, and nothing else and A.J. Terrell, that is, to me, as viable of a plan as any other version of what this team could look like in the next 12 to 24 months. So I can completely understand it from that sense. Sure. Yeah. I mean, this has been our biggest problem with the Falcons dating back for over a year now is like, who are they? What direction are they going? What is their long-term quarterback plan? Um, I'm just going to be real interested. You know, he's agreeing to meet with these teams. Is he going to waive his no trade clause for all of them? Would he waive it to go to Carolina, New Orleans, Cleveland? Seems seems like maybe he would waive it to go to Atlanta. So he does hold a lot of cards here. And if he wants to go somewhere that doesn't seem like the most conventional fit by all the other football metrics, I guess I guess that's his choice. The Carolina thing is just very strange to me. I mean, they're all the turnover in their offensive coaching staff. Their offensive line is not good. They have some weapons, but there aren't a lot of <laughs> pluses in the Carolina column for me as it relates yeah, no, to the except- football situation there. Yeah, it just except they're I think they're going to be very aggressive in their pursuit. Yeah, because they're in the same spot as Atlanta, right? We don't have a plan. So this is now our new plan. And it's better than the old plan because at least we end up with Deshaun Watson. It doesn't matter what it costs to get there. So again, I understand their interest in this. I'm not sure why Deshaun Watson would be that interested. Yeah, One, I mean Cleveland is probably the best football setup of those four definitely. teams. Definitely. I mean, they they have a roster that's almost close to complete. And if you again you go get a receiver. I guess they wouldn't have a first round pick in this scenario, but I mean, they're uh, to me, I do think that they're in the best spot. All right. So the one other thing with the Browns, they released JC Treader today. It, the offensive line was getting very, very expensive, which it makes sense to ultimately have to save in one place or another. They have two of the most expensive guards in the league. You know, they felt like Nick Harris, who's got some spot time for them, could step in and do a decent job. I totally understand that. JC Treader hits the market as an attractive center, especially when you consider what happened yesterday. Ben Jones goes back to Tennessee. Brian Allen goes back to the Rams. Ryan Jensen goes back to the Bucs. If you're a team like, I don't know, say the Chicago Bears, a guy like J.C. Treader could make sense to you. And with Chicago, there's a lot of points of connection there. Luke Getze was in Green Bay when J.C. Treader was in Green Bay. Alex Van Pelt, who is the Browns offensive coordinator, was in Green Bay with J.C. Treader when Luke Luke Getze was on the staff. Those guys know each other. It's a pretty quick phone call of, hey, you think JC still got it? Absolutely. We just couldn't make it work. Okay, sounds good. That's it. I mean, those little tiny things, I think, ultimately do matter in processes like this, and they have a need there. So I would like to see the Bears make that phone call. Yeah, and it's going to be there, – there's a couple others. I think Alex Mack is a name to watch to see if he ends up on the market at some point. Um, but, yeah, JC wants to keep playing. Um, he's very uh, – He's very reliable. I think he missed He's one available. game. Of- that is a huge thing for me. He's available, yeah. which at that position is really He missed important. one game because of COVID last year, but otherwise I don't think he missed a single game while he was with the Browns. Um, he was very much a security blanket for um, for Baker Mayfield. You know, they're going to miss him, but uh, ultimately, like, they had to make a cut somewhere. Um, Ravens? Steelers? Could he switch to the, switch teams within the division? Well, I'm the trying Steelers, to... we're going to get to the Steelers in a moment. The Ravens, I think, could be a possibility as they shuffle their interior the offensive line. Bradley Bozeman is also somebody that's available if a team needs a center. But with, moving to the Steelers here for a moment, the Trubisky terms were not out when Nate and I recorded yesterday. Two years, fifteen million. It's totally fine. I, yeah, it's totally fine. It, who cares? That's backup quarterback money. Yeah, I, I dipped in while you guys were talking about why aren't the terms out. And Nate was like, is, is it because they're so high? And I was like, no, 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 it's because they're so low. They're embarrassed. They don't want them out there. Um, or the agent. One or the other. It was one or the yeah. other. And now it makes a lot of sense. So he got back. That's backup quarterback money. That's high end backup money. So if you're the Steelers giving him seven million dollars a year and not giving up a pick, I do think is totally justifiable. It's a preferable path than going with a Jimmy Garoppolo, for instance, where you'd have to give up a real pick potentially and pay him $25 million. And with that savings, they have rebuilt or added to their offensive line. They re-signed Chuck Sikor for three years, $30 million, about $20 million or so guaranteed their right tackle. That seems like a lot. It's kind of the going rate for right tackles like that in free agency. I believe it's the same deal as George Fant got from the Jets. Like If you look at some points of comparison like that's happened a couple different times 
And then Mason Cole signed a three-year, $15 million deal. And James Daniels, this is the one I like, three years, $26 million. $8 million a year for 24-year-old James Daniels, who's bounced around a lot in Chicago. I People in the league are adamant that he's a center. I remember talking to a GM recently where he was like, he's a center. He should play center. And that, I think, raises a question. What are the Steelers going to do with these three guys? It, it, where does Kendrick Green, who they drafted last year, where does he end up fitting? Where does Daniels end up playing? Where does Mason Cole play? Kevin Dotson is obviously in that mix. Does he move back to right guard where he was actually better a couple of years ago? So a lot of moving pieces there, but they've added a lot of bodies. And they've used some of that financial flexibility of $7 million of Mitchell Trubisky to kind of make sure that group is functional this year. I just don't think, and I know you and Nate talked about Steelers quarterback plans a bunch yesterday, but it just doesn't feel like this is the, there's got to be another move coming. Is this the contract be a tells you guy? Yeah. So it's, it's like, you know, you can kind of look at it and you can make some jokes or you can say, okay, maybe this is a chance for him to resurrect his career. And um, it just, it just doesn't feel like they're done. And it's been frustrating for many years that the Steelers haven't done more to kind of address their long-term succession plan for Ben Roethlisberger when you could see this coming. Um, but yeah, you think, you know, he how do you think he would have taken that? Not great. <laughs> I think that's part of the <laughs> Probably about as great as Aaron Rodgers would have. Um, although I don't think he would have turned it into an uh, back-to-back MVP seasons. I don't think. I, I don't think so him. either. So I am excited to see a quarterback who can move there a little bit. It'll be jarring to have it on our television. Screen. It is going to be. A, we we talked about this yesterday. It's going to be weird. It's going to be such a weird offense. It's going to be tons <laughs> of motions and, and the ball. I mean, he. That's what they should do. I mean, if you're not going to be good, at least be weird. And I think that's the point that they need to reach with Trubisky, at least in the short term, as they figure out what this is going to look like. But when a contract, listen to what a contract is telling you, I think is something that I've learned over time. And that contract tells you that this is not a long-term commitment. This is a, let's see what happens as we look for whoever our quarterback of the future is ultimately going to be. And to not compromise yourself financially when you're going through that process, I think makes a lot of sense for the Steelers. All right. We're going to talk about some of the other biggish signings that have happened since we recorded yesterday. Before that, though, let's take a quick break. Spring is so close that you can almost feel it. So it's the perfect time to get outside and move whatever your speed. Allbirds just released a new Tree Dasher 2, the next generation of their best-selling, insanely comfortable running shoe made from a mix of natural materials that's better for you and better for the planet. It was gorgeous in Chicago this afternoon. Me and my fiance went for a little walk. I threw on my Tree Dasher 2s, walked about three and a half, four miles. So incredibly comfortable. I love the way that they look. Allbirds is a perfect slip-on, do-everything option. But with the Tree Dasher 2s, you can also add a really high-quality running shoe to the mix. This is the next evolution of Allbirds best-selling running shoe, adding comfort to every run with lighter, more responsive foam, extra grip, and an improved fit to keep you running and nature winning. Spring forward with the Allbirds Tree Dasher 2 running shoe. Discover your perfect pair at allbirds.com today. That's A-L-L-B-I-R-D-S dot com. Our next partner is a great product that I use literally every day. Let's talk about Athletic Greens. If you're looking to get better gut health, more energy, or a stronger immune system in a really easy, natural way, you've got to check out Athletic Greens. I'm sure you'll all agree that most of us aren't huge fans of taking a bunch of pills or vitamins in the morning. With Athletic Greens, you can get rid of all those extra vitamin bottles and finally make some room in your cabinet. It's the all-in-one solution that actually tastes good. You'll really enjoy taking your daily vitamins. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. Tons of people take some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one with high in quality ingredients that your body can actually absorb. Athletic Greens is a small micro habit with big benefits. It's one thing you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the cold and flu season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash maze. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash M-A-Y-S to take ownership over your health and pick up your ultimate daily nutritional insurance. 
All right, let's run through some of the bigger signings that have happened since yesterday. Marcus Williams, five years, $70 million with $37 million guaranteed to go to the Ravens. The Ravens were a team we thought might be in the safety market. And when I was talking to Sheil and Nate last week, we mentioned Tyron Matthew as a potential Ravens fit. Instead, they go and get arguably the top safety on the market. Five years, $70 million, $37 million guaranteed is a big deal, but it's not crazy. It's not market setting. I mean, he comes in just under the Kevin Byard Buda Baker number, just ahead of what Quandre Diggs got yesterday. It makes sense for both parties, in my opinion. Um, I love it. I think it's my favorite deal of the day. Um, I know we're we're going to talk at, kind of at the end of the show, wrapping up some of our favorites. Um, so far, it's my favorite deal of the day um, for fit for the team, fit for the player. The contract isn't nuts. I um, mean, we're not seeing, you know, resetting of the market with some of these deals. The, the, the defensive back market, that's kind of, I think we're going to get into some of the cornerback stuff. We've seen some big deals, but we haven't seen those crazy, like, holy shit, I can't believe yeah. they're breaking the bank for these positions. Um, so I like it. I think the it Jags sense. don't have a need at that spot. That's, why. <laughs> that's fair because the Jags are investing all of their money in off ball spots. It's like, I, you look at where the Ravens defense is now, they still have needs up front and I, I just keep waiting for them to sign Zedaria Smith. It would be the most Ravens bullshit to obviously, well, the Marcus Williams move is a little bit out of character. They don't really go for these huge splashes in unrestricted free agency. You know, a lot of the time they'll make moves where like Kevin Seiler last year is a perfect example, right? Gets cut, doesn't play into the comp formula. Marcus Williams absolutely does. But to have Zedaria Smith, let him walk for, I would assume a fourth round comp pick and then wait for him to get cut and then sign him for half of the price after he's released and have it not affect the comp pick formula is the most Ravens stuff that you can really. Yeah, I mean, that's like Bill about. Belichick level shit, but that's uh, what the Ravens do all the time, but <laughs> they did with Pernell McPhee. It was just not as impressive yeah. because he's not as good of a player. So this is uh, the most Ravens thing that they could possibly do is bring back to Darius Smith at this point, because they do need help up front. I mean, that is absolutely a spot where I mean, there are a lot of bodies, both on the interior and the edge. So I would expect at least yeah. one more move in that area for them. Yeah, I mean, Clay's Campbell's a free agent right now. Yep. Um, it, it ultimately does he come back? Yeah. So there's some questions there, but feels like that I, would make sense. I don't know. Is Clay's Campbell? Does he want to start over at this stage of his career? Yeah, I think he wants to check it out. Um, he wants to kind of just see, okay, what's the market like? You know, he's gotten to do this a couple times now, but see what's the best fit. Ultimately, that would probably be my. You know, if I was betting on it where he's going to go, that he'd come back. But um, I just, I like it. I just didn't think it was a crazy deal. It just made a ton of sense. You know, Eric DaCosta has earned a ton of that um, benefit, benefit of the doubt, right? Where um, they don't make a ton of like dumb moves. You know, I say, okay, if, if DaCosta wanted to spend the money here, I think there's a reason they really like this guy. Um, and I just, uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. My favorite move of the day. All right. So our own Connor Hughes at The Athletic had been reporting that the Jets were in on Williams and they were interested in him. He goes to Baltimore. Joe Douglas pivots. The Jets signed DJ Reed. Three years, $33 million. This is around what the Ronald Darby contract was last year. I mean, it's just starting corner in free agency. And this is makes sense in terms of value. They needed somebody at that spot. I mean, their secondary was an absolute disarray coming into this process. And they had a lot of money to spend. So it, obviously he has a history in that Seattle scheme with which Robert Solid knows extremely well. So that is a little bit of a little point of connection there. And then it sounds like the Jets also signed Jordan Whitehead yeah. in the process. Yeah, I believe that's happened right before we started recording. So, and it's yeah. barely in my outline as a result of that. So the Jets add two guys to their secondary. Those were huge positions of need. I mean, I, they signed a guard, they signed a safety, they signed a corner and a tight end. They signed CJ Uzama yesterday. Three years, twenty-four million. I mean, those are the spots. If you're looking at this roster, that's where they needed guys, and you know, they paid up for some of them. You know, Ten million dollars a year for DJ Reed isn't a cheap contract. What they paid for Lake and Tomlinson isn't a cheap contract. But this is how you have to spend in free. They have to overpay have starters. So it, this isn't <laughs> this isn't Zay Jones for thirty mil for ten million dollars a year or whatever it was in Jacksonville. To me, these all of these make sense, even if they are slight overpays, because that's the nature of what this process looks like. Um, the Jordan Whitehead deal, two years, 14 and a half. Yeah, I mean, th those kinds of contracts, we talked about it with Barnwell. When you're hunting in the three and a half to 5% of the cap type deals, which a lot of these are going to, I think the Reed contract will be just over that. But Uzama, uh, Uzama, Jordan Whitehead, those sorts of deals, 
very rarely do those haunt you because you're really not giving up that much. It's $7 million a year. If it's the first year and a half is guaranteed and you have to move on, it's three and a half million dollars in dead money after year two or whatever it is. It's it, those aren't going to sink you. So it, even if the ceiling is lower, the floor is also higher with deals like that. So you're not really sitting there ever thinking, oh, man, I can't believe we have this guy on the books for this amount of money. And that's a range where the Jets seem to be shopping right now. Yeah, I mean, I don't buy it. There, there's no part of me that expects the Jets to be this year's version of the Bengals. Um, but these were the type of some of the type of deals that the Bengals made last year to fortify their roster. That would you pair it with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase launch them on this path to an AFC championship functional NFL defenders is yeah. what the Jets needed on the back end of their defense and that is what Jordan Whitehead and DJ Reed are let's stick with the quarterback musical chairs here Charvarius Ward three years 40 million dollars to go to the Niners good for Charvarius Ward undrafted I mean had a really nice run in Kansas City this is similar in terms of value to the deals we saw handed out to Shaq Griffin last year to William Jackson it's real free agent quarterback money with the cap going up. I think that the cap, the percentages would be similar to those two guys. It's an interesting fit. I mean, he is a physical, was a physical press man corner with the chiefs. That's what they did. And I think it's worth watching as you see some of these teams, they're really had quarters heavy on early downs uh, or, you know, too high based on early downs, the chargers, the Niners, what kind of corners they're going for right now, because JC Jackson with the Chargers doesn't necessarily make sense for a real zone heavy team at first glance, but I totally understand why they're doing it. How are they going to let Traverius Ward play within that defense is something worth watching for me, but this was a need for them. And it, I think it gives them a, a different feel to that cornerback group than what they had. Yeah. It, it breaks formula. This is the most money they've ever spent at that position in the um, John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan era. Um, but it was a clear need for them. So um, I, I like it. I, I'm wondering exactly what it means for Kansas City to lose him. I think they thought there was a chance that they were going to be able to keep him. They've gone um, cheap at corner in yeah, this regime, I mean, right? I mean, they've never really spent at that position. And I mean, they yeah. reacted to this by giving Justin Reed a three or $30 million contract. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that I, I think we already kind of knew this was coming, but Tyron Matthew is not going to be coming back to Kansas City. Yep. I mean, they were, that was kind of part of this plan. Justin Reed is about two thirds the cost of what Tyron Matthew was. Uh, but now their quarterback depth chart is Legarius Sneed and Rashard Fenton. I believe when you're um, playing in a division that has a lot of really good receivers and a lot of really good quarterbacks. So um, AFC West is going to be going to be wild. And I just, I want to see if they do something else. It's been fascinating how they pieced that together over the last couple of years. I mean, going in Deandre Baker and Mike Hughes and these kind of buy low propositions they've engaged in at that spot, they've managed to cobble it together. And the way that the defense is structured, they rely on the safety so heavily. And it feels like that's, what they see Jordan Reed or Justin Reed as. I mean, he's a really, really good athlete. And I assume they're going to try to use him in a multifaceted role. I mean, that defense is really predicated on disguise and all of those moving pieces. And he's his movement skills are obviously fantastic. He played a decent amount in the box for Houston last year. He can play a little bit everywhere. And my guess is that's what they're going to ask him to do. But it, he's not Tyron Matthew. And I think that's yeah. something to keep in mind. Yeah, and they're, you know, he's going to have to take over probably a lot of the leadership stuff, the um, lining everybody up, being the voice in the room, all that kind of stuff. I think he's capable of doing that for sure, but it's a big void for the Chiefs to lose Tyron Matthew, the person, and what he meant to um, to that locker room and that team during, the, during kind of this, you know, two Super Bowls, that kind of run. Before we take another quick break here, I wanted to just touch on the Jag spending spree that continued after we stopped recording yesterday. Zay Jones, three years, $24 million. That's the craziest one to me. What we now, that one is, you can talk yourself in to the Christian Kirk one. Even if it's, a, it's an overpay, clearly. You can talk yourself into it. He has juice from the slot. They need somebody like that. I still think it's wild, but at least, I think you can talk yourself into it. The Zay Jones one is just, I don't understand it at all. I and, don't either. And now, and now there's going to be other dominoes that come with that where, you know, now that they're going to have to move LaVisca Chanel, who I really like. And that's not just because I watched him play a lot of Colorado, but they had some like good depth receivers and now you're overpaying for some of these other guys. And what does that mean for the rest of your roster? So I don't know. Everton I don't know what Trent Balky is doing. Evan Ingram, one year, 9 million. Fine. 
a worthwhile flyer if you thought that that offense was such a disaster. You use him in a really specific way. We got the Brandon Scherf terms, $16.5 million per year. Reset the guard market, which you can expect for a player with Brandon Scherf's pedigree for his peaks, even if he's injured a decent amount and you have to worry about that. It's not surprising to see him top the Joe Tooney number from last year. Base salaries in 2022 and 2023 are guaranteed. He has a $20 million cap hit next year. That's what they did with all of these big contract guys. With Kirk, with Luakon, and with Scherf, they have big bumps after small cap hits in 2022. So, I mean, all three of those guys are going to be making around $20 million against the cap next year. The cap is going up, but... This is what you do when you hand out these massive contracts in free agency. I mean, eventually those, as as soon as next year, you're going to look at those cap numbers and be like, oh man, those are high. Yeah. And they are moving out. Cam Robinson is only there for a year. I mean, just, I don't know. They've already cut, they cut Miles Jack. They cut today. Miles Jack. It, they have so much cap space. Trevor Lawrence is on a rookie deal. I understand all of this. When has this ever worked out? When have you ever looked at a contract like the Kirk one and be like, you know, I'm, I'm glad this is on the books. This is definitely going to take us where we want to go. It, this could be an outlier. He could be a good player for them. Their offense is better because Christian Kirk is there. But just this path and this version of a plan, it, it, there's just so few examples of it working out well for someone. So with all of those moves, now DJ Chark is the, the odd man out in Jacksonville. He signs a one-year $12 million deal for, with the Lions. Makes perfect sense to me. Fine. I mean, they absolutely have a need there. So I'm on Ross St. Brown. It obviously, does a very different thing than what DJ Chark does. They needed an outside receiver. They have cap space. I mean, this is the type of move that he's not going to block anyone. If they draft a receiver, they can play all three of those guys at the same time. So understand how you land here if you're the Lions. And he's somebody with real upside. Out speed, size on the outside. I mean, if you let's say he hits. And you want to make him part of your long-term plan. He's still very young. I get this from Detroit's perspective. Yeah, I mean, two years ago, he was a thousand-yard receiver. Um, I think as recently as the 2020 season, he was like 90 plus catches. His um our, our Larry Holder had some really good telling stats about how few of the past like so he's a lot of targets, but not a super high catch percentage. But so many of his balls were deemed to be uncatchable. Um, so look, I don't know if that's gonna get that much better playing with Jared Goff necessarily, but um, I don't think his stats necessarily indicate the type of player he is. So um, pretty low risk move there for the Lions, who are also interested in uh, Allen Robinson, but I think ultimately decided that um, they weren't going to spend whatever Robinson was going to get, who is still out there. But I Jerk think is younger to too, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's another yeah. question you have to ask yourself is like, where can this go? If it does yeah. work out, I mean, it, DJ Chark is, is a few years younger. So I have a question for you. If you were a team that needs a quarterback and you were one of the teams when the music stopped that was left without someone, we're running out of answers for that, by the way. I think that's affecting the Jimmy Garoppolo market. And I mean, the Colts and what they're going to do is obviously a question. Jared Goff has a $10 million base salary this year. The Lions would save $15 million if they trade him. I'm just, I'm, I'm just bringing this yeah. up. I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. I don't know. The, at this stage for the Lions, I don't know if saving that $15 million would be worth it for them. They'd be left without a quarterback. I think they want to appear mildly competitive. There are culture questions involved there. Who's going to be your quarterback? Maybe the $15 million in savings isn't worth it. But I don't know. It's just a name. Because it, there are so few guys that their team isn't connected to them for any long like for the long term. Where it's like, oh, well, he's not going to be in their plans two years from now, so maybe he'd be available. But it's kind of funny that so many of the quarterback seats have already been taken that I'm not sure who would even be interested in Jared Goff. But when I was looking yeah. at their cap, it just jumped out to me. Yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, well, then who? Is it the Colts? Would the Colts want Jared Goff? Would the Saints want Jared? Whoever loses out on the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes, would they want Jared Goff? I, you know, there's just not a ton of landing with the, the Seahawks. I mean, I'm trying to think of who, who are the rest of the – those are the those are the teams. There. Those those are definitely the teams. Look, I mean, he's he's not great, but he's made it to a Super Bowl. Like, what's the gulf between Jared Goff and Jimmy Garoppolo? What's Ten the million dollars. If, Jared if you, Goff and Carson Wentz. That's kind of what I'm saying. I mean, if you need a, a functional quarterback this year, and his base salary is ten million bucks, and you can get him for 
some draft capital. Is that worth it? But again, we're running out of teams that yeah. need that sort of answer. At and the Lions might be happy with our, him being their functional quarterback as they bridge to whatever they're going to do. In exactly. Time. Maybe the $15 million they save isn't worth it for the Lions. All right. We're going to take one more quick break and then we're going to wrap it up here. This episode is sponsored by Good Shop. With Good Shop, you get a flexible monthly subscription plan for high quality American meat and seafood. Good Shop offers convenient, contact free delivery right to your doorstep. Their orders are fully customizable. You can choose beef, chicken, seafood, and pork products you like the most. For example, their beef is well marbled Angus Choice and Prime Cuts, or you can get delicious 100% grass fed steaks, whatever you prefer. With the seafood, it's sustainable and wild caught, whether you want salmon, Pacific cod, or something else. Good Shop especially prides itself on sourcing beef that comes with no antibiotics or added hormones ever. There's no artificial ingredients, only the good stuff. I have loved my experience with Good Shop so far. The steaks that we got, just really good fillets that we threw in the sous vide, made with a little sweet potato roast in the oven. It was a perfect, easy weekday meal, defrosted it overnight. It was fantastic quality. They sent scallops, again, just a quick defrost, Sear them in a pan, really easy, delicious, quality weekday dinner. Go to goodshop.com slash maze100 and use code maze100 to get $100 off your first three boxes. Again, that's goodshop.com slash maze100 and use code maze100 to get $100 off your first three boxes. Good Shop, America's online butcher. The beginning of a new year is a great time to finally start things like diets, workout routines, or thinking about your financial future. Even if you don't plan on getting off your couch in 2022, you should at the very least do one responsible thing while you sit there. Check out Wealthfront.com. You can start investing in no time with Wealthfront's classic portfolio or make it your own with things that you care about like socially responsible funds, technology, crypto trusts, or hundreds of other investments. Wealthfront was designed by financial experts to turn your good ideas into great investments without the hassle of doing everything yourself. Don't want to spend hundreds of hours trying to lower your tax bill? They help you do that. Not sure how to rebalance your portfolio or what rebalancing is? They do it for you automatically. Wealthfront is trusted with over $28 billion in assets, helping nearly half a million people build their wealth. And the best part is their product is so simple yet powerful that it has 4.9 out of 5 stars in the Apple App Store. To start building your wealth and get your first $5,000 managed for free for life, go to Wealthfront.com slash maze. That's W-E-A-L-T-H-F-R-O-N-T dot com slash M-A-Y-S to start building your wealth. Go to Wealthfront.com slash maze to get started today. All right, before we get out of here, wanted to talk to you about some of your favorite moves some of your favorite plans that you've seen here over the first 36 hours or so of free agency sure well i already talked about the marcus williams deal um i, I obviously really i obviously really liked that one um i'm trying to know i need to i'm trying to, need to go back through all of the ones from yesterday jc jackson to the chargers um i think i really just like the chargers overall plan and that's it's not just because of my afc west homerism i swear that's not the only reason that i like this i just in general, and I think I've been pretty consistent with this over the course of my um, career or whatever. I just like plans. I wanna see teams that know who they are, what their identity is, and what their plan is to improve and to build around the assets that they have. And I very much appreciate that the Chargers, Tom Telesco and Brandon Staley, they understand what they have in Justin Herbert. And they're, they understand the weaknesses of their team too. They understand what went wrong for them in 2021 and the things that they needed to do to improve. And that was addressing their defensive line. Um, and they went ahead and did that. Um, Sebastian Joseph Day, um, Austin Johnson, a couple front seven players to add to Khalil Mack from last week. Um, and then JC Jackson just gives them a corner that they're gonna have a ton of flexibility with. So um, they're probably my biggest winner so far in free agency. And usually it's, you know, the teams that make the most moves in free agency, those aren't the teams that ultimately win later on. I just think they've been very strategic and very smart about the guys that have gone out and acquired so far. If I was building a priority list for the Chargers this offseason, it would have been, and even just knowing, having a sense of what they needed and what they wanted, interior defensive line, a corner. That was Those are the two biggest things. You get depth in the interior of the defensive line for run stuffing especially and go get a corner. And then a right tackle is still on that list. They've done two-thirds of that 
and we'll see what happens at right tackle. And they got Khalil Mack. Khalil Mack was not part oh, of yeah. that conversation. So them going to get Sebastian Joseph Day to the Chargers made the most sense to me of like any player team value fit. That's exactly what they need is the type of guy who creates that connective tissue of your defense, especially up front against the run. We've seen him do it. He did it for Brandon Staley with the Rams. Him, Austin Johnson are going to fill those exact roles. J.C. Jackson gives them some flexibility. Khalil Mack is an excellent run defender. I mean, you add him to Joey Bosa, it's everything they want from a physicality standpoint. In that defense now, a little bit, you, maybe some depth at linebacker later in the draft, things like that. But for, for now, it's almost close to complete. You add a right tackle somewhere along the way, and you find some juice at receiver, maybe even in the first round. Now we're talking. And you, again, you don't want to overrate or overstate how important some of these early moves in free agency are. But I think when you look at their roster, when you look at their needs, when you look at where they want it to go, it's encouraging. It's really exciting what this team is shaping up to be right now. Teams that were a little quieter, but I, I kind of appreciated the ways that they've attacked this. I think the Dolphins' approach to this makes total sense. Right? The Chase Edmonds contract is reasonable for a, a running back. They go get Cedric Wilson, Connor Williams on a two-year $14 million deal. You just need bodies. You know, Connor Williams isn't great, but they need functional NFL offensive linemen. That's what he provides them. I also thought the Austin Corbett contract to Carolina was pretty good for that reason. That The Panthers absolutely needed another starter in the interior offensive line. They got him for about $8 million a year. And they go get Teddy for $6 million a year in Miami. So their approach right now, I think totally reasonable. I always am interested in what the Bills do, how they approach this, just because they've been such a fascinating team in free agency over the last couple of years. And they've just done so much Bill shit over the last yeah. day or so to go yeah, get Tim Jones, who I like. You know, Tim Settle, who couldn't find a spot in the rotation in Washington, but is perfect for a Buffalo team that lets their guys play 42% of the snaps. Roger Saffold is there now going to get JD McKissick to add like a very specific. That's what I really that. liked. If you can just see it right to add a very specific skill set to their backfield. So just everything the bills do, I always looking at it in, in this time on the calendar, just because I think they always have a really interesting plan and it makes sense in a lot of ways. And then the giants are taking on a very bills esque approach in what they've done over the last day. Going to sign, getting John Feliciano to play center for a year. Mark Lewinsky on a three year, $18 million deal to be a, again, a functional right guard for them. Bobby Johnson, who was the offensive line coach for the Bills, is now with the Giants. This process of, all right, we're going to go get you a bunch of moderately priced pieces and you figure out how to use it. That's the process that they went through in Buffalo for years. Just dice roll after dice roll after dice roll in free agency. And it seems like they're trying to do that again as they cobble this group together. So those are just three teams that jumped out. They're not necessarily good or bad, but just their set of moves overall, I, I found interesting to me. Um, I'll say we, we talked about the chargers before Brian Bulaga officially has been cut while we have been here talking. So it was kind of a procedural move that we were all expecting. Um, and now we just kind of wait to see what the quarterback, I, I think it's the, what's going to happen with Sean Watson. How quickly is this move going to happen? Um, and then maybe what, what else is going to happen with this edge Russia market? Yeah, I think those are the uh, some of the other big dominoes, right? Von Miller, Chandler Jones, what ultimately ends up happening there. Teron Armstead, you know, yeah. does does Deshaun Watson's choice affect what he ultimately wants to do as it relates to New Orleans? So we will be keeping our eye on all of that over the next day or so. We will be back tomorrow, same time, th excuse me, 4 p.m. Eastern with Shield. So please come. Before we sign off, the people want to know if you're going to be wearing your glasses tomorrow. I did not know the glasses would be so controversial. I, I'm just saying I logged in because I wanted to see um, after the Christian Kirk deal yesterday, I like logged in to the live chat because I just wanted to see what you guys, how you were reacting to it. And I was just stunned to see the glasses. And I tweet, I, I got in the chat. Now people are asking about the glasses. So people want to know. Casey about, always was on look. me because I didn't have glasses. And she's like, how do you not have a pair of glasses? Because I wear contacts. But I haven't had a pair of glasses for years. I was like, all right, it's time to finally get glasses. And the first day I wear them, it just becomes a thing. Well, Barnwell giving me shit about it. So uh, I'm going to be sparing in how I use the glasses from now on, I think. I'm well, I just very, about it. People said you looked like you were trying to get into Hogwarts. So then it got into this whole discussion about like a sorting hat and which house would you be in? And I had to explain that Nate and I have tried to teach you about Harry Potter. No, and... You can't tell people this, that I don't <laughs> care about Harry Potter because it's like the worst thing you can say on the internet. I don't dislike it. I just never, it's never been important to me. 
when we went to Harry Potter World during Super Bowl week, which was a very fun media party version of the media party. We all went to Harry Potter World. And when we turned the corner and Nate saw the castle, Nate and I lost our shit. He had a religious experience. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's a very impressive feat of human engineering. But there was nothing deep in my soul that was affected by no, seeing I Hogwarts. Mean, yeah, I know. Like Nate and I were crying. We were like, like hyperventilating and Robert was like, whatever, it's Friday night, no big deal. So anyways, we had a great time. It was a very pleasant evening. All right. That's all we got. Tomorrow she's she gonna will be, be wearing the glasses. It'll be great. I I may wear the glasses again. She will be here at Do 12 it. PM. Don't let us shame you out of the glasses. Wear the glasses. They're right here, but I have my contacts in it makes gives me a headache. She'll is gonna be here with us at 4 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. So please come check that out. She'll has obviously been grading all of the moves in free agency on the athletic. You can go read that. If you go grab an athletic subscription at, at excuse me, at, 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 at the athletic.com slash football show. If you do not have a subscription, I highly recommend that you go grab one. Now we'll be back tomorrow with Sheil, And then Thursday, Nate and I will be back with another live show. So we will keep these coming over the next couple of days for now. I appreciate you guys listening. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.